Sweden has a long history of preserving ingredients that were available during summer and autumn. Everything from drying, curing and brining to my favourite, fermenting and pickling. It's one of the best ways to enjoy the flavours during the cold and dark winter months. When I walk around the forest, I think, OK, berries, mushrooms, and that's just about it. With your experience and your knowledge, you must walk around and think, yes, I could make this, I could make this, I could do this, I could do this. Absolutely. What really keeps me passionate about my work today is that finding as many tastes as possible with each special plant. And I guess that's the exciting part is you can experiment and be creative in the kitchen. Uh-huh. Lena Ebbetson is a former chemical engineer who now fully focuses on producing pickles from the forest. Forest has been an important part in the whole of my life. She pickles anything from pine shoots, dandelion sprouts, berries and mushrooms. One of her more famous products is an oil made from spruce shoots, used in fine dining restaurants all over Scandinavia. When you pick, mm. the spruce defends itself and start shooting more shoots from okay. the same point. Yeah. So the more you pick it, yeah. the denser it is, the more shoots we get. All this picking has made me very curious to see what the end product looks like. Let's go. Right, Lena, what are we going to make now? Now we're going to make oil, spruce oil. Lena, what gave you the idea to do spruce oil in the beginning? Oh, um, I started out with the more simpler things, like syrup. And then after a while, I got very tired of sweet things. Mm. And I wanted to find a new taste from the same raw material. So I started out with, with oil. I guess it's something which is very natural to people in France. They talk about terroir, mm. about, mm. you know, growing things, and it's really, it really has the flavour of the land. Mm -hmm. But it's not something you think of about Swedish produce in that sense. No, that's right. We have never had the terroir stuff. We have more of a survival thing. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. The cold, dark winters. It totally makes sense. The best thing with this is you don't need a gym. The colour is amazing. The colour of green is my favourite colour. <laughs> Would you have guessed? <laughs> Thank you. Mmm. Yeah. You really taste the spruce. Mm. Like, it, it's captured that flavour of the spruce just right in that little bit of oil there. And this is... What is this? Try it. OK, all right. Wow! So it looks like an olive. It looks like an olive. And it has that kind of pickle taste, and, mm. but there's a, like, a little almond flavour to it. Right. And that's, that's the... This is small plum, unripe plums that wow. have been fermented for nine months. I'm going to have to have another one. It's so You'll good. go ahead. <laughs> Being able to visit and try different produce is a huge inspiration to my cooking. Like my approach to so many different cuisines, I'm not trying to reproduce the exact same flavour, but to put my own spin on the Swedish dishes that I have experienced. Nothing adds a more genuine taste to a dish than being able to cook it in situ. And what better way to make myself at home than cooking in a typical Swedish countryside cabin, or stuga as the Swedes call it. It's hard to fake an old style kitchen. The wood burning stove, the smell, the history, to have a cabin is very common in Scandinavia, and the home away from home is usually kept as a reminder of how people used to live. This is a place to unwind, to get away from always being on the go, to recharge and remember what's really important in life. Living in Sweden, I quickly discovered this country has an abundance of ingredients from the forest. Berries, mushrooms and game. And my Borboritos is a fantastic way to celebrate these flavours. I'm going to start off making a spice blend. So I've got some onion powder, salt, some ground allspice, flavour that pops up a lot in Swedish food, white pepper, give that a little mix. And then you want to get your boar shoulder, or if you can't get wild boar, just use pork. Pop your spice mix on top and then give it a good massage. A little bit of oil, and when you feel it's nice and hot, 
then put the pork in or your boar in. You want to sear the meat to lock in the flavours. When you've got a bit of a golden crust, you can turn the meat over. Once the meat is seared, I'm going to add some hot chicken stock. Be a bit careful when you add your stock because it does have the tendency of splashing back. Turn the heat down, a few sprigs of thyme. Cover it and let the magic happen. Basically, you just need to let it simmer until the meat falls away. That's roughly one and a half hours. So these bull burritos are loosely inspired by traditional burritos, but I'm using Swedish ingredients. Firstly, some horseradish. I'm going to add some lovely heat to my sour cream. I'm quite generous with my horseradish because I like it really spicy. I'm going to add a bit of salt. Horseradish cream done. Got some romaine lettuce here. Roughly chop this up. So now let's check on the meat. Have a look. I'll turn it off the heat. Just be careful, it's a bit hot at this point, so you might want to let it cool down a couple minutes before you start shredding. Grab two forks and then you just need to shred it. It should be really easy to do because the meat is quite literally falling apart. This is a great dish to do if you're entertaining quite a few people because you can prep a lot of things in advance and you can just put it all on the table and everybody just helps themselves. One Swedish tradition I discovered from living here in Sweden, which I thought was a bit unusual, was uh, Taco Fridays. It's uh, this thing that Swedes love to eat tacos on Friday. It's a bit like how in England they love to have a curry on Friday. To stop the meat from drying out, I'm just gonna add a couple of ladles of stock. I've warmed up some Swedish flatbread in the oven. If you can't get hold of Swedish flatbread, tortillas will work. I have some Swedish brown beans here. So they're slightly sweet, uh, a little bit spicy with cinnamon and allspice, but you could use a tin of kidney beans warmed up, that would work. Just need to plate it up, grab a flatbread. Now it's all about just building your own burrito. Some horseradish sour cream. There's no particular way of doing this. Anyway or anyway. Beans, some shredded meat, a little bit of salad, best of and cheese, or you could use mature cheddar. A few pink pickled onions. The hardest part is wrapping it up, so key with this is not to put too much in it, otherwise the bread's never gonna wrap around all the filling. Or it's, <laughs> better said, it's not gonna fit in the mouth. Mmm, I couldn't think of a better way of eating ball. Flour and bread play an important role in a lot of cultures. Breaking bread is common practice in many societies as a way of forming a bond. It can also be a reflection of the culture it comes from. The durable and convenient Swedish crisp bread, or knäckebröd, reflects the Swedish survival mentality. This mill focuses on making flour from local ingredients, milling old-fashioned grains such as spelt and rye as well as the traditional wheat. The five-generation family-run business also uses an old milling stone to produce a more nutritious whole wheat flour. Wow, what an amazing old mill. So you've got the grains at the top? Yes. And then it then comes, it comes through down, there? Down, down in between yeah. two stones. Okay. And then the milling starts work. All right. So how do you get it going? Well, you twist on that wheel. Okay. And you have to... Oh my goodness, I can't do it. Should I you help sure? you? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I need to go to the gym more often. This old mill still crushes grain between two stone wheels installed by Rickard's relatives in 1780. The more modern area was built around the old stone mill. Here, grain is crushed and separated from the husk, then sifted in order to get a completely pure product. This makes the flour extra fine, perfect for making a light and fluffy cake. I see here that, like here, you um, ne'er produce it. So you work with local producers. Um, what are you really proud of in terms of your flour? I don't have any chemicals in the flour. Yeah. It's very natural. 
So it's just the flour. You're not getting any conservation. Nothing. I love baking. And what I've learned about Swedish food is you love knäckebröd, Swedish yeah. crisp breads. So what flour would you recommend if I was going to make a Swedish crisp bread? Ray? Yeah, OK. Rye flour? Rye yeah. Flour. And I see you do uh, spelt flour as well. Yes. I love uh, spelt flour because it has such an amazing flavour. <laughs> yeah. It does, and it smells good. Yes. And it's, uh, it tastes very good. Brilliant. Thank you very much. My love for baking with different flours has only increased after visiting the mill. Each flour has its own qualities, like spelt with a light nuttiness and rye with a wholesome fruity flavour. If there's one thing you can always find in a Swedish kitchen, it has to be knäckebröd, Swedish crisp bread. My favourite kind is one made with rye and sourdough. I've got some lovely rye flour here. Plain flour. This balances out the heaviness from the rye flour. A teaspoon of instant yeast. And then here I have dried sourdough starter. And the reason I'm using it is for the flavour. It makes it a little bit more complex, a bit more interesting. Teaspoon of salt, about a tablespoon of sugar. And then I want to combine everything together. And then I'm going to add some very soft butter. And finally, some buttermilk. I just want to bring everything together. Press the dough. Right, it's coming together really nicely. Press it into a ball. Now I'm going to pop it in a clean bowl. A little bit of oil in there so it doesn't stick. Cover it up with some cling film and then let it rest for about an hour and a half in a warm spot. The dough's been resting. The reason you want to let your dough rest is that it'll make it easier to roll out. If you roll it out straight away, the gluten is developed and it's, it's just rubbery, bouncy. Dust your work surface and then roll it out. It doesn't really matter if it's not perfect or round shape. I quite like it when it's a bit rustic looking. Traditionally, Knekebro are about record size and they have a hole cut out in the middle and I always wondered what that hole was. And apparently, it's from hanging them up on a pole from the ceiling. Okay, and now I've got this, um, well, it's not, a, <laughs> it's not for massaging your back. It's actually a rolling pin to prick the dough. But if you don't have that, you can just use a fork. And what that does is it helps keep the knäckebröd flat. I'm going to flip it over, roll the other side, and then that goes into the oven. So you know when your knäckebröd is done, when you have these lovely kind of slightly burnt brown edges and it should feel crisp. I think the best way to eat knäckebröd is to keep it really simple. A few toppings, that's all you need. A little bit of cream cheese. Then I have some pink pickled onions. I always have these in the fridge. To make your own pink pickled onions, bring 400 millilitres of water, 300 millilitres of vinegar, 100 grams of sugar, 30 grams of salt and 20 juniper berries to the boil. Stir and leave to cool before adding 750 grams of sliced onions. Store in a sterilised jar. Some Swedish olives. Oh, they're actually little green unripe plums. A little spruce oil. Swedish knäckebröd, the simplest way to add a little Swedish touch to your kitchen. When it comes to a celebration, you can't beat an impressive cake, but it doesn't mean it has to be difficult. With a few easy steps, you can make your own layered lemon and yogurt cake. First thing you need to do is make some lemon curd. I'm gonna zest my lemons. When you're zesting, you really just want to get the top layer because that's where all the flavor is. Don't grate in the white part because that has a bit of bitterness to it. And lemon zest smells very citrusy. 
Now I'm gonna juice the lemons. Give them a little roll and squeeze. That helps to release the juices. Really important just to use 125 milliliters of lemon juice. If you use too little, then your lemon curd's gonna be too thick. If you use too much, then you're gonna have a runny lemon curd. Avoid getting any pips in. Cast the sugar. A little pinch of salt, some cornstarch. That just helps thicken the mixture. And then three eggs. This is the bit where you need to be careful. You don't want to have too high a heat because otherwise you will curdle your eggs and then you get this eggy flavor to your lemon curd. So when it's thickened up, you can take it off the heat. Add some soft butter and carefully stir that in. And now what you have is like a thick, glossy lemon curd. It needs to chill and set. So I'm gonna put it in a jar. Your lemon curd can be made three to four days in advance and kept in the fridge. My yogurt cake recipe is not very complicated at all. Start off with some sugar, soft butter, pinch of salt, and you want to beat that until it's soft. Add one egg at a time until incorporated. Then some yogurt and lemon zest. Plain flour. Baking powder. Plain flour and the baking powder mix go in. You just want to fold that through until it's all well combined, but don't over mix the mixture. And then that's going into my lined cake tins. Flatten the mixture. Just want to smooth out the top of your cakes. That goes into a preheated oven at 180 for about half an hour. Now you know when your cakes are ready, because obviously it smells good, but you can give it a little skewer test. It should come out clean. Time for some icing. To make the icing, you need three ingredients, soft butter, icing sugar, and cream cheese. The key to this recipe is super soft butter. Add the icing sugar and start whisking slowly. The secret to good icing is always making sure you whip up that butter until it's a very pale color. I'm gonna add my cream cheese. This is one of my favorite icings to do because it's not too sweet with the cream cheese in it. If you wanted to, you could flavor the cream cheese icing with some spices like cinnamon or cardamom, but I like it plain. Right, that's the icing done. Now I'm just gonna slice my cakes. If you find that it's got a bit of a dome, you can even it out. And then I'm gonna cut it in half. And when the line joins up, go all the way through. I'm gonna put a little bit of icing on the cake stand. This is just to stick the cake down. And then it's just about building the layers and spread it on. Don't have to go all the way to the edge because what will happen is when you put all the other layers on, it adds a bit of pressure and the icing spreads out slightly. I'm gonna get my chilled lemon curd. You can see it's set really nicely. Again, not all the way to the edge. Then next layer. Last bit of lemon curd, that goes on top. Now if you wanted to, you could leave it naked. This would be a naked cake. Or you can do it semi-naked, which I'll show you how to do now. Okay, so this is a semi-naked cake, and if you wanted to, you could just decorate it with some flowers, but if you want a very nice finish, what you need to do is put it in the fridge for 30 minutes for the icing to set, and then do another layer of icing. Last layer of icing. This cake is not for the faint-hearted, especially if you're intending to be on a diet. Forget that. I don't do cakes by half measures. To get a really smooth finish, you want to dip your palette knife into some boiling water. 
could simply leave the cake like this or add a bit of decoration. I've got some rosemary here. I'd say less is more when it comes to decoration. A cake worthy of a celebration, I think. The Swedes are not ones to boast about their traditions. My lemon and yogurt cake with its simple flavors is an understated way to enjoy the Swedish tradition of fika. That time of day to sit down for a coffee and a slice of cake. Not too dissimilar to the British tea time. It has been an inspirational start to learning more about Sweden's food culture, and I look forward to discovering many delicious delights this country has to offer. This is Hornstuhl in southern Stockholm, an area that has gone from being regarded as the outskirts of the city to hipster central with food trucks and street markets. Before the arrival of the food truck, Swedes got their fast food mainly from hot dog stands. Like the Brits who might have a kebab after a night out, the Swedes will head for a hot dog at their local stand, or grill in Swedish. Swedes love their hot dogs, and some even claim they existed here before their invention in Coney Island, New York. In Sweden, however, they use some strange combinations. I will get a tunnbröd rulle. Tunnbröd rulle. Yeah, with kors, grillad kors. Grillad kors. Yeah, and then I am not sure which topping I should have. Um, the best one for the tunnbröd rulle, yeah. it's this one, it's shrimp salad. Okay, shrimp salad. Is that typically Swedish? Yeah. And then what's this one here? Uh, that's Boston Gurka. Um, with mayonnaise. With mayonnaise, okay. yeah. Hmm, I actually might go with the mayonnaise. Mayonnaise? Yeah, cucumber. Yeah. Cool. You want any drink? No, that's great. Thank Perfect. you very much. Tack så mycket. For me, a rather unexpected ingredient pairing is to have prawn salad. Prawns and mayonnaise topping a hot dog. Here at this old hot dog stand in Stockholm, they put their own spin on it, using Swedish flatbread, mashed potato, hot dog and a prawn salad. Wow, that's one hot dog. <laughs> There you go. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Turning a hot dog from a light snack into a meal with all the additional toppings has been done for years in Sweden. Chefs around the world have taken inspiration from street food like hot dogs, transforming them into fine dining versions with the use of luxury ingredients and restaurant cooking techniques. My smoked sausage potato cakes with prawn salad is inspired by the Swedes' love of hot dog with mashed potatoes and prawns. Something rather unusual, but a bit like a Swedish surf and turf. Some hot water on the go. Generous pinch of salt. Peel my potatoes. Add your potatoes to the boiling water and just cook them until they're tender. I've drained my cooked potatoes. I'm gonna let them cool down before I use them. I've got some smoked sausage here. I'm gonna grate that. I'm using good quality Frankfurter sausages, which are slightly smoked. I'm grating the sausage because it means it gets equally distributed through the potato cake. You get that smoky flavor throughout. And then discard the skins. Add the sausage to a bowl, some chives, a generous handful. The chives bring a freshness that cuts through the smoky and rich flavors of the potato cakes. Chives are a popular herb in Swedish cooking. Chives go in the bowl. Now to bind the potato cakes together, you'll need one egg. Some pepper. Give it a little mix. So once your potatoes are cool enough, you can grate them. Add the potatoes to your bowl and mix everything together. Before I fold my patties, I'm gonna get a pan nice and hot. Add a little bit of oil, some butter, add 
a tasty flavour to your potato cakes. And then form your potato mix into four patties. You fry them on one side until you develop like a golden crust, flip it over and fry it on the other side. So you want a lovely golden brown crust. With my potato cakes, I'm going to have a very simple prawn salad. Just with some lemon zest, lemon juice, and a little bit of salt and pepper. Prawns go in. Squeeze in a little lemon juice. You can start off with half and then add a little bit more if you need it. Bit of pepper, pinch of salt, toss that together. It's really just a light, fresh dressing. Mm. Delicious. Okay, I'm gonna just check here with the potato cakes. So you know when your potato cakes are done and you've got a nice crust on both sides, you can tap it, it feels a bit crunchy. Switch it off, and now you just need to plate it up. So I've got some baby jam lettuce, which I really love. Generous dollop of creme fraiche. It ties everything together, that cool creaminess. Your prawns, a sprig of dill. And then if you want to, if you have a little bit of lemon zest left, you just grate a tiny bit on the top. And that's my Swedish surf and turf. The Lane region in southern Sweden is famous for its beautiful countryside and farmlands with many apple orchards. It is often called the Garden of Sweden for that very reason. Autumn is the busiest season here with apple festivals and huge outdoor apple markets. Apple trees are probably as common as Swedish cinnamon buns. They pop up everywhere, on farms, in gardens, in the wild and even in city dwellers' backyards. I especially love discovering the local Swedish varieties that don't make it to the supermarket. One of the best things about picking your own. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. When you have amazing produce like these Swedish apples, you have to make something mouth-watering with it, like my hazelnut and apple cakes. I'm going to toast some hazelnuts in a dry pan. You know when your hazelnuts are toasted? They have a lovely colour, but they also release a delicious aroma too. Put them in a bowl to cool down first. I'm just going to give the pan a quick wipe. I'm blitzing the hazelnuts so you get a powder. So it's a slightly coarse powder. It doesn't need to be super fine. A bit of texture is good. Now, one of the key things with this recipe is to brown your butter because it adds a caramelised flavour to the cake. Pop the butter in the pan. It's quite easy to know when you've browned your butter to the right colour because you can actually see the colour changing there. And also, you can smell this light kind of hazelnut fragrance. This technique hails back from the days of making French pastries. They call it beurre noisette. Beurre noisette actually means hazelnut butter. Take it off the heat and add a tablespoon of honey and set that aside until it's cool. Now I need to whisk up some egg whites. You want to be super careful not to get any egg yolks in your bowl. Any traces of fat will stop the egg whites from whisking up. So generally, using a metal bowl or a glass bowl is best because they don't have any traces of fat. When you use a plastic bowl, it's really hard to get it super clean. And if you've made a dressing in that beforehand, it's a bit risky. So you want to froth up your egg whites before you add your sugar. The consistency you want for your egg white is like a very soft peak. So you can see it's super floppy. Nothing too stiff. I'm gonna to mix together my dry ingredients. 
I've got some plain flour, a little bit of ground vanilla, a pinch of baking powder, salt, and then the ground hazelnuts. Mix them together. You can really smell those toasted hazelnuts in there. And that flavour is just going to be emphasised by the burn noisette. Fold in about half the mixture, just to loosen it up. Make sure you always fold all the way to the bottom. And now you can fold in the rest. It's key not to overbeat the mixture because you've obviously incorporated all that air with the egg whites. Last bit is to chop up an apple. I have a buttered bun tin. Now, if you don't have a bun tin, you could just use a muffin tin, that would work as well. Sprinkle some apples in the bottom. You just need to pop your batter in. They go in the oven at 200 degrees for about 15 to 20 minutes. Yay! They are looking good. So I'm going to turn them out, put them on a cooling rack. Give them a little tap. <laughs> they should come out really easy because I buttered them well. Yes, they did. Fantastic. Mmm, those apples smell delicious. If you want to add a finishing touch, Give them a light dusting with icing sugar. The perfect cake for Fika, or any time of the day, really. The perfect cake to serve with a cup of coffee or tea. In southern Sweden, there are many family farms that have their own country farm shops. I'm on my way to a small sausage maker to find out more about their artisanal approach to making and smoking their own sausages. Hello! Hi Rachel! <laughs> How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Collecting some wood for some yes. smoking? Can you help me with this? Yeah, sure. The owners Jonas and Sebastian left their previous jobs at an exclusive restaurant in Stockholm in order to make their own sausages. And do you have a, a particular kind of wood? Yeah, uh, all in Swedish. It's a good wood because it works out with most kinds of meat and also vegetables and cheese and fish, so that's why we use it, because it's... An uh, all-rounder. Fantastic. The logs of the alder tree produce an aromatic smoke that has long been a favourite to give flavour to meat, seafood and even coffee. In the UK, sausages sometimes have a bad reputation because people used to use all the rubbish kind of offcuts of meat. But here you're trying to do something a bit different, aren't you? The meat is very important. We use only meat from pigs that go out, outside all year round. And they're also uh, Swedish? They're local in that sense? They're local. They're, they're from Skåne. So is this your special blend? It's uh, inspired by German bratwurst. What's particular about the bratwurst? Cumin. It's a very uh, important so, uh, flavour to it, mm -hmm. I would say. Just let it slide off. And, and this is uh, the skin, yeah. which is basically intestines. Want to try? Oh, OK. All right. <laughs> no, it's good. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Yeah. Do you twist the sausages in any yeah. way? So, so you take one hand there, yeah. one hand there. <laughs> and then? You just twist it the same way toward. OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like this. It works. Yeah? I've noticed when I first moved to Sweden that sausages pop up everywhere. Like um, at the corner shop, at the, you know, you have all the hot dog stands. Boiled sausage and bread. This It's really our traditional street food. Mm. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd get a job here. <laughs> Jonas and Sebastian's passion for sausages is reflected by their use of high-quality local meat and avoiding preservatives and colourants like nitrate. 
They love to experiment with different types of sausages, such as the classic Frankfurter or the larger, fatter German Bratwurst-style sausage, which is flavoured with cumin and other spices. I can hear some sizzling sausages. Yes. Are you ready for a taste? <laughs> yeah, I definitely am. There Fantastic. You go. So, what have we got here? Wiener sausage. It's mm -hmm. the thinner one. And yeah. then uh, the bratwurst we made, and the thicker one. So this is not like the Venus I've seen before. Usually they're that kind of bright orange colour. Yeah, <laughs> because they use uh, nitrite mm. in them, and uh, we don't, so... It tastes better than the ones I've eaten. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice to hear. <laughs> um, lightly smoked, no? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. They remind me of the Venus my grandma in Austria used to make when I was right. a kid. Good quality meat, nice. so... Um, That's what we'd like to hear. Yeah, <laughs> brings back some childhood memories. <laughs> and this is the bratwurst, That's the bratwurst, it? the one you made. Yeah. Mmm. <laughs> well, so I'm going to do a recipe. I'm going to do a Swedish stroganoff. And I think the vina would go best yeah. for the recipe. So yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some vinas home. The sausages were packed with flavour and a far cry from the simple hot dog on the street. These are delicious and perfect to use in my recipes. Smoked sausage stroganoff is a classic Swedish comfort food that can be made up in a jiffy. You need to get a pot of boiling water on the go with plenty of salt. Really important to salt your water to cook your pasta. Traditionally, stroganoff isn't served with pasta. It's usually served with rice, but I like it with pasta. In the meantime, I'm going to chop up an onion. Onion chopped up. I'm going to add some butter to my pan, get the pan nice and hot. Pop the onions in. So I've got a smoked sausage here. You could use a frankfurter. Well, these are kind of like frankfurters, uh, but smoked sausage works the best. So the Swedish stroganoff is nothing like the stroganoff I used to grow up with. So my mum used to make a beef stroganoff, the creamy sauce, mushrooms, this one has a creamy sauce, but there's tomato paste and paprika in it. So it's rather red in colour. For a vegetarian version, replace the sausage with 350 grams of finely chopped aubergine and one teaspoon of smoked paprika instead of plain paprika. I'm going to check on the water. Yeah, great, it's boiling, so I can add my pasta. I'm using pappardella, but you could use tagliatelle, even penne, or like I said, if you want the traditional version, serve it with rice. Once you've got a lovely caramelization going on, you can add your other ingredients, which is gonna be a tablespoon of Dijon mustard. Tomato puree. Some paprika, fabulous for the color. Add some single cream. Plenty of black pepper. Now, if you find your pan is really hot and the sauce is drying out, switch it off at this point. And what we're gonna do is add a bit of the pasta water to loosen it up. That's why it's very important to salt your water because you're gonna actually use some of that water. Also, it flavors the pasta. I'm gonna add some capers. It's not what you normally do, but I really like that little zing, little pop you get. So these are quite big capers. I'm gonna chop them up a little bit. Capers go in. The starch from the pasta water will add a slight glossiness and sheen to the sauce. Add your pasta to your pan and toss it together. You want the sauce to coat the pasta. I don't like putting sauce on pasta, like serving it like that. I think you should do it the way the Italians do it. it tastes much better. 
All that's left to do is to chop up some chives, a generous handful. Sprinkle the chives on, and that's my smoked sausage stroganoff. Mmm. It's often the humble ingredients that get overlooked, but I love the fact that in Sweden the modest sausage is celebrated in all forms. Whether in a hot dog with lots of additional toppings or in a home cooked dish. It's hard not to admire the way Swedish cuisine celebrates simple ingredients, whether it be a sausage or an apple, and turning them into delicious dishes. It takes only a 10 minute drive from Stockholm before you hit the vast Swedish forest. Sweden is the fifth largest country in Europe and half of it is covered by trees. Spending time out in nature is part of the culture and mushroom picking is what every Swede does at the end of the summer or early autumn. Ah, uh, I think I've got lucky. Look, two little golden dots. That looks like a chanterelle to me. <laughs> it's not gonna make much of a meal, they're very small. <laughs> Look at that, tiny. Oh well. It's a start. Growing up mushroom foraging means that most Swedes know which mushrooms are edible. Otherwise, the old rule applies. Don't pick it if you don't know if it's safe to eat. The few mushrooms I've found will be the base for my main dish, mushroom risotto. Time for a little break. I brought some pea soup along. Typical Swedish pea soup. Not forget the Swedish mustard, essential. A good squeeze. I'm using a sweet Swedish mustard, which isn't very spicy. Trust me, it tastes really good. You might not always be successful in the forest, but you can always just enjoy just being here. the time to enjoy nature or stay a few days in a countryside cabin is very Scandinavian and mushroom picking is just as much about being outdoors as it is about finding anything edible. A full basket or an empty one really doesn't matter. In Sweden pea soup isn't the bright green kind, it uses yellow dry peas to make a heartwarming and comforting soup. I've soaked some peas overnight in some water with some salt. It's a very simple soup. You start off with just frying off some mustard seeds. You want to toast them nicely to release all those lovely flavours. And when they start popping, you know they're ready. I can hear some pops. Oh! <laughs> all right, so I'm going to add the water and then all the peas go in there as well. And then it's just about popping all the other things in. A little onion powder. Four bay leaves. And really important, some good quality smoked bacon. I'm using smoked bacon that is uncut. A piece of smoked pork belly would also work. That's gonna flavor the soup. Lovely smoky flavor. And then all you need to do is let it simmer for about an hour and a half to two hours just until the peas are tender. Mmm, it's starting to smell good. Just check whether the peas are tender. They are. Perfect! Just gonna fish out the bay leaves and the bacon. We'll set that aside for later, because we can use that. We're not going to waste that. Give it a quick blitz. So you can make it as smooth or as chunky as you like it. I kind of like it in between. I 
think that's just about right. Check for seasoning. Have they need any extra salt? A little. If you find the soup's a little too thick, you can add some stock. Let's not forget this lovely bacon. I'm just gonna shred it. Watch your fingers, it might be a little hot. The first time I had this soup, I was in the south of Sweden and it, we'd gone for this wintry walk. We'd come back and we were like runny noses, cold hands, and it's the perfect soup to warm your hands and your stomach with. Okay. This soup is a great one to make in advance, have in the fridge and warm up. You can even freeze it. A little bit of the shredded bacon, put that on top. And then, if you're really Swedish, you have to have a squeeze of mustard on top. This was a revelation to me. Never tasted this before. Need a good, generous squeeze. It's not pea soup without the mustard. Last little touch, a bit of thyme. And that's it. My Swedish pea soup. This recipe is loosely inspired by a northern Swedish dish called pulsa. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, it's a pearl barley porridge topped with crispy mints and beetroot and a fried egg. So I've taken a little bit of inspiration by using pearl barley, which I'm gonna toast. And you're just toasting it to release the lovely nutty flavors. Meantime, I'm gonna chop up our onion. This is the bit where I get emotional over cooking. Now for the carrot. The carrot and the onion is gonna form the base for your risotto. It's definitely smoking and you can actually see the pearl barley is starting to toast really nicely. You just want a light brown color, and then you can also smell. It smells a bit like popcorn. You only want to soften your onions at this point. It's not about caramelizing them. And once the onions are soft, you can add your carrots. They go in. A generous amount of allspice. Give it a little stir. Mmm, you can smell the allspice. Pearl barley goes in too. Give that a good stir. And then we're gonna add some stock. You can use vegetable stock or chicken stock. Give it a very gentle stir to check there's nothing sticking on the bottom. And then you can just leave it to simmer away. The pearl barley will absorb the stock. You don't have to do any stirring. It's a bit of a lazy risotto. Well, actually, don't tell the Italians. It's not even risotto. Leave to simmer for 20 minutes or until the pearl barley is tender and top with extra stock if it dries up. My risotto is actually finished. The stock has been absorbed. You can see it's got like this lovely creamy texture. Before I finish it off, I need to fry some chanterelle. While that's cooking, I'm gonna finish off the risotto. A little sour cream adds that extra level of richness, but also a tiny acidic note. Give it a taste, always important a tad more salt. Parsley, always good with a bit of green and freshness. Let's 
check on the mushrooms. I think the mushrooms are done. You don't want to overcook them, otherwise they go mushy, <laughs> soggy. Right. This risotto base is great to top with anything you might have in the fridge. So if you had some crispy bacon, you could add some roasted vegetables. It's really very adaptable. So this is my favorite Swedish cheese. It's Vesterbotten, kind of similar to mature cheddar. A hard cheese, it's got a lot of flavor, quite salty, delicious. And a touch of parsley. My little taste of the forest, a toasted barley and mushroom risotto. We can fly, fly. on my way to my friend Sem, who according to me, makes the best ice cream in Stockholm. He loves to experiment with unusual flavors. Sem has also been a great Swedish teacher during my stay in Sweden. Hey Sem! Hey Rachel, is it good? Yeah, it's good, how are you? It's just good, thank you. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Welcome. I'm here to taste some of your amazing ice cream. All right. And see how you make the magic. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So what I love about your flavors is, well, the, the, when I first discovered it, I heard the music first. Uh huh. Because you love hip hop, <laughs> like old school hip hop. Oh yeah, yeah and for sure. And like some of your flavors, you've named uh, after some hip hop artists. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like like the the salt and pepper. So why is it called salt and pepper? Because it has uh, sea salt, mm -hmm. um, and it has um, Indonesian pepper called batak pepper. Mm -hmm. Uh, which which tastes sort of like lemongrassy. I'll have to try that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Wow. A bit more it's citrusy. Super fragrant. It's not what you expect of salt and pepper ice cream. No. But no. delicious. Yeah. Absolutely <laughs> delicious. Tell me about some of the other flavors you've got. So. I've got this one, mm -hmm. which is um, rosemary mm -hmm. and blueberry black currants yeah. um, with crushed graham crackers. So blueberries is something you use a lot in Swedish yeah. food. Uh, this one, mm -hmm. which is chocolate ice cream mm -hmm. with mud cake chunks. Yeah. And then I've like made a salted caramel and mixed it together yeah. with peanut butter. And um, yeah. so on the top is like a Swedish kladdkaka, as they say. Exactly. Wow. Kladdkaka is the Swedish version of a chocolate mud cake. So kladdkaka is like one of those cakes which appears almost at every celebration. Yeah, I think it's so easy to make. Yeah. So you just like whip up uh, a batch and you put it in the oven for like 20 minutes mm. and then you're done. So you're kind of m marrying American flavors, what I always think, like chocolate peanut butter with a Swedish flavor ingredient. I, I don't really think too much about origin. And no? I'm not too much of a Puritan either. Okay, so like... you just like whatever <laughs> tastes good, yeah. whatever feels right, you go, you go with your emotions. I don't know, I want it to be fun. Go <laughs> with the flow. Yeah. I mean, these are all delicious. I'd love to see how you actually make the ice cream. Oh. Do you think you could show me? For sure. Oh, amazing. <laughs> Let's do Thank it. you. Let's have a look. Yeah. So this is your ice cream base. Yeah, this is my base. Cream and milk, sugar. Mm. So, so what's important with the ice cream base? It's the balancing. If you put five grams too much of something or too little of something, the texture will be off. Messed up. And the sugar, because obviously the sugar affects how it crystallizes yeah. in the ice if cream machine. If you put too much sugar, yeah. then it'll be like a milkshake. If yeah. you put too little, it'll be like an ice cube. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, so this is unflavored. So what flavor are we going to make? I'm thinking we're going to add a lingonberry and cardamom jam to this. Wow. Uh, wow, that looks gorgeous. Yeah. Look at that color. Then we add some graham crackers, which are sweetened crackers. Yeah. All right, do you think I'd get a job here? Yeah, for sure, you're hired. <laughs> I think I have to try it. I think so too. All right. This looks delicious. It does. Wow. 
This is like a... Is this one of your top sellers? Um, I wouldn't know. It's the first time I make it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, lingonberry, cardamom, with grain crackers on the top. Amazing. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. Right. This will keep me going for my little trip to my next place. Thank awesome. you so much, Sam. Oh, thank you. All Thanks right. for coming by. <laughs> I will enjoy this. All right. See you later. <laughs> Take care. Hey See you. Hey <laughs> now. The summer is quickly shifting to autumn this far north. But the light is still here, and it's one of my favourite times of the year. A time to relax and let nature prepare for the cold and darkness that will be here soon. My lemon and dill parfait uses a key Swedish flavour, dill. Combine that with some lemon and you have a zingy, refreshing dessert. I'm going to separate my eggs first. So the egg yolks are going to cook over bain-marie. So it's just some simmering water, bowl on top, and I'm going to whisk it with some sugar, a little bit of vodka. Really important to finely chop it. Dill adds a light aniseed flavour to the dessert, which complements the zestiness of the lemon. Smells good. You want to whisk this until it's thick and pale. Now, it might be a bit unusual to add a little bit of vodka, but what it does, it just stops all the ice crystals from forming in your parfait. The alcohol lowers the freezing point and prevents larger ice crystals from forming. It's very important not to have boiling water because otherwise your eggs will split and you end up with a sort of scrambled eggs. Okay, so it's thickened up. It's a little paler. I think I'll take this off the heat because it's done. I'm going to whisk up my egg whites. I'm going to start whisking and then gradually add the rest of the sugar. So you're looking for a fairly soft beak. You can see the little beak there. Well, you can always do the test and hold it over your head. The famous head test. Right, so the egg whites are whipped up. Just got a little bit more whipping to do. I'm going to whip up some cream. For the cream you want soft peaks, don't over whip it, otherwise you end up with a grainy texture. Now it's about bringing everything together. We've got like three kind of components. You've got your flavor in your egg yolk and dill and lemon mix. You've got some egg whites, which add like some volume, some air, and the cream, obviously volume, air, but also that richness to it. Ah, a little bit of sour cream too. Make sure your egg yolk mix is well cooled before you add it. Now I'm gonna combine that with the whipped cream. Gently fold that through. Make sure you go all the way to the bottom of the bowl so you get the bits at the bottom too. And then add half your egg whites and fold that in gently. The rest. This is such an easy dessert to make for entertaining. You can make it ahead of time and just have it in the freezer ready to go. Okay, so that's all nicely incorporated. Don't overwork the mixture. I'm gonna add it to my lined tin. Lining your cake tin makes it easier to remove the parfait. Let's move it out a little bit. And then a finishing touch. I've got a bit of lemon curd, which I'm gonna ripple through the parfait. Now I'm just gonna marble it through the mixture. Fold the cling film over. That goes in the freezer for about six hours. You just want it to set. Twenty to thirty minutes before you want to serve your dessert, 
take it out the freezer and pop it in the fridge. Just makes it a lot easier to slice. Dip your knife in some boiling water. Hot knife, you get a clean cut. A little sprig of dill and a touch of lemon zest at the end. My lemon and dill parfait, a zingy way to finish your meal. From foraging for mushrooms to slowly stirring the risotto on the stove, the slightly slow and gently way of cooking and taking time to reflect captures what I love about living in Sweden. Uglub Farm is located right by the coastline in southwestern Sweden. The produce grown on this farm has a reputation for being unique in flavour and appears on fine dining restaurant menus all over the country. You're right by the sea here, aren't you? Yeah, rather Do, close, yeah. Does that affect uh, the way you have to grow the cabbages or the flavour of the cabbages? The salty wind. Actually, I have customers who really want to buy especially kale that will grow very close to the sea because they told me that it tastes a little salt. OK, yeah. so it picks up the salty air. Yeah, I think so. Delicious. Can we pick one of them? That one, maybe. Yeah, that looks great. Yeah. Fantastic. Perfect. We'll pop that in the basket. No. So you've got pointy cabbage. What other types of cabbages do you have? I hear a broccoli, cauliflower, a lot of different kind of kale, yeah. different colours. Yeah. They sound so crunchy, the leaves. Yeah. Perfect. So I pop that in there. Cabbages, kale and root vegetables have always played a big role in Swedish cooking and they are ingredients that the Swedes take for granted. But they can be used for so many good things. Do you find there's one particular cabbage that is the most popular one in Sweden? Uh, black cabbage, svartkål. Oh, svartkål. black cabbage, like, OK. Yeah. So in the UK you call it Cavallo Nero by the Italian name. Yeah, it's become very fashionable. Yeah, very. So you say the same fashion in, in Sweden, um, people are, yeah. uh, like they enjoy eating it. make chips out of it, they fry them in oil. Yeah. yeah. So you make Cavallo Nero crisps. Crisp, yeah. So slightly healthier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that colour. So this is the really dark kale, isn't it? Yeah, the purple one. Beautiful. Unlike myself, who doesn't fare well in cold weather, kale actually becomes a more vibrant red colour the colder it gets. Let's head out. So this is uh, curly kale? Yeah, this is this curly kale. Like this. Yeah, you can eat like just Yeah, this. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Super crunchy. Yeah. So where did your passion for, like, growing cabbages and different vegetables come from? I actually start when I was only six years old. I remember I was growing peas. I don't know why. Okay. It's, yeah, it's growing quickly up and yeah. it was nice to look at. They're and, pretty with the yeah, flowers, yeah. aren't they? Mm -hmm. Should we go? Yeah. yeah. Sweden has an unspoken law called Jantelagen. It's a social norm that says you should not brag about yourself. This can at times hinder progress, but it also teaches you to be humble and thankful for what you have. This is also true in Scandinavian food, taking simple products to make something special. The humble cabbage, a misunderstood vegetable. The best way to cook it, I think, is to cook it lightly. So, let's start. Cut this into quarters. I've got this fantastic pointy cabbage here, but you can go with any cabbage you like. I mean, cabbages come in all shapes and forms and sizes. Key to this recipe is some butter and lots of it. Make your life easier by using soft butter. It won't work with butter straight out of the fridge. Right. On the tray they go. If you don't have a barbecue or open fire, what you can do is just put the cabbage under the grill. Same job. Over to the fire.
just have to watch out when you're cooking these because they can cook quite quickly. You want to make sure they're just charred a little bit. I'm going to let those cook and I make my vinaigrette now. Now the vinaigrette, it's nothing extraordinary. It's a simple mustard vinaigrette. I've got some sweet mustard here, some vinegar for the acidity, some oil, salt, very important. You want to make sure your cabbage is well seasoned. And then you just have to pretend you make cocktails. Give it a little shake. This is the easiest, messy, free version of making a vinaigrette. Okay, the vinaigrette's done. I've got some hard boiled eggs. I'm gonna peel. Just a finishing touch to my spring cabbage vinaigrette. Ready to plate up. I love cooking cabbage this way. It goes all crisp and sweet, slightly smoky, very delicious. Now, I always like to double check my vinaigrette and the easiest way to do it is just to take a little leaf, dipping it in the salt. And having a little taste, just check for the acidity or you need more salt, but that tastes pretty spot on to me. All you need to do at this point Give it a good drizzle. A little bit of hard boiled egg. Grating hard boiled eggs is a little retro, but it's coming back into fashion. Adds a little bit of creaminess. And then finishing touches, just some chives, a bit of freshness to cut through all the other different flavors. Sprinkle that on top. And that's all you need to do to make a cabbage tasty. My cabbage vinaigrette is not unlike the classic French starter, asparagus mimosa, where asparagus is served with a tangy vinaigrette and boiled eggs. When thinking about Swedish food, you don't often think about tomatoes, but actually it's very common to grow your own. When it comes to large-scale tomato farms, it is a different story. The weather is too cold and the winters are too long. But there is a place in southern Sweden where they manage to grow beautiful and great-tasting tomatoes in all kinds of varieties. What's the growing season for tomatoes? We actually start the tomato growing in, in uh, February, week seven, and then we are get out the first tomatoes in April, middle of April and then we are going to the end of October. I'm after some tomatoes, which would be good for a salad, but I think yep. we're doing well, but it maybe is. a few other colors? We're going to go to uh, the next book. I think there is uh, some other very beautiful tomatoes. All right, here. let's okay. do that. Yeah. How many varieties do you have of tomatoes? 83. 83? Yeah. The color, size and variety of each tomato will impact the flavor. From green tomatoes with a tart floral flavor to the deep red colored ones that are fruity and sweet. What kind of tomatoes are these? This is Gianita. Okay. And, uh, that is one of my favorites because it loves tasting that one. So All like right. It. So would, what? Uh, can I pick? I'll of go course. for the red ones. Yes, here. go for the red ones. And is there a particular way you pick them? We pick them always from upstairs because you see the red one is there, and then yeah. it go the calorie goes down and yeah. you get greener and greener. So I always pick the first one up here. Yeah. All right. I might try one. Is that okay? Of course. Mmm. <laughs> It's okay. Sweet. Sweet. Mm. Lovely. Tasty. Yeah, delicious. So, now you're coming to my next block. Ah, all right. Yeah. You just go around just eating tomatoes. <laughs> I do that every day. I have a basket full, enough for my salad. Mm, Fantastic. I hope so. mm, <laughs> Thank lovely. you very much. Thank you. I've just got one more stop to make to pick up a vital bit of equipment. 
Kwe Psud has made cast iron cookware since 1906. The work is hard and visiting the factory is like a door into how factory work was like at the turn of the last century. I'm here to discover what makes an authentic cast iron pan so durable and to find a traditional Swedish waffle pan. So this tradition of making cast iron pans in this region mm -hmm. is quite long, isn't it? Yeah, 112 years. 112 yeah. years? Yeah. And what do you love about cast iron pans? They last forever. They can take high temperatures. Many people would inherit cast iron from their parents. So it's something which is passed on through the family. Exactly. <laughs> but I mean, I love cooking with cast iron because it really retains the heat. It does, yeah, yeah. So it's great for when you're doing like stews. And this one you can actually pop in the oven. Yep, you can. Which is great. It's super useful when you want to start off on the yep. hob and then finish it off in exactly. the oven. And then I love this one. Yeah. This is so Swedish. No? It is. It's a Swedish classic. Waffle iron. OK, well, it sounds perfect for my cooking. Yeah. I'll definitely be happy cooking with these yeah. back in my studio. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm all set to make my next dish. When it came to trying my first Swedish waffle, it was love at first bite. My Swedish waffles, however, have a little twist on them with a butternut squash. It's not what you normally put in a recipe, but it tastes delicious and it gives a lovely colour too. Oh, <laughs> need to struggle with chopping this in half. I'm just going to scoop out the seeds. So you only need half of the butternut squash and that's going to go in the oven. You want to roast it until it's tender. Place the squash into a preheated oven at 180 degrees fan. It should take roughly 45 to 50 minutes. So you know when the butternut squash is done, it looks cooked and it is basically tender, soft. I'm just going to scoop out the flesh and pop it in my bowl. It's all mushy. You want it like a, a puree, no big lumps, basically. Before I forget, I'm going to melt my butter. Now, with my butternut squash, I'm going to add all my wet ingredients. I have my milk. It's going to go in my buttermilk. This is where it's handy to have a really big bowl to make it in. Otherwise, you make a mess. And then two eggs. All right, melted butter. I'm going to add almost all of it. I need to save a little bit for my waffle pan. Mix that in. Right, wet ingredients done. Now it's just about mixing the dry ingredients together. OK, so just some plain flour, nothing fancy. A bit of baking powder, just help the waffles rise. Dusting of cinnamon and a generous pinch of salt. I'll just give that a little mix. And then we just combine everything together. Don't want to overmix the batter, because if you overmix it, then you develop the gluten and then you end up with rubbery waffles. And who wants rubbery waffles? Right, I'm gonna let this rest for about 20 minutes or so, just so the batter settles and makes for a better waffle. So, while that's resting, I'm going to make a few toppings. I'm going to use these amazing tomatoes I picked up. I always think it's best to work with seasonal ingredients. It means you don't have to do so much work in the kitchen. When they're in season, tasty, juicy, there's really not much to do. You let the ingredients do the work for you. A bit of salt, a good glug of olive oil, some parsley too. We'll just let that sit until we need them. I'm just going to put the waffle iron on the fire so it heats up. While the waffle iron is heating up, I'm going to do a sweet topping, which is literally going to be some whipped cream with cloudberry jam. Now, the trick to whipping cream is make sure your cream's really cold and have a cold bowl too. This is where I get my daily workout. Cream contains tiny globules of fat, which are solid when the cream is cold, and these support the air bubbles, resulting in a fluffier and airier cream. You just want some soft peaks, nothing too stiff, otherwise you'll be making butter. I'm going to pop that back in the fridge until I need it. And now I can make some waffles. A little bit of butter. So it's important to butter your waffle iron. 
plenty of butter. If you don't have a waffle iron, you could use the same batter to make small round pancakes in a frying pan. And wait for the magic to happen. Fingers crossed. Ah, uh, yeah, it's not looking bad. <laughs> you can see the heat's a bit uneven because it's a, a bit darker on the back side. A couple more minutes and it should be done. This is where you can't be impatient because if you're impatient, what happens is the waffle is still sticking in the pan. It's done when it doesn't stick anymore. Oh, I think this waffle's done. This is where the factory line begins. Grease up again. Okay, two waffles ready to go. You can really top them with anything you fancy. That's the joy of it. Sweet, savory, or whatever you find in the fridge. A little fridge forage is always good. Crispy bacon. Can't go wrong with that. Just to finish off, a touch of parsley. There you go. Waffle one. For the sweet one, a generous cloud of whipped cream. And a little bit of cloudberry jam. Cloudberry jam is made from a tart aromatic berry which looks similar to a small yellow raspberry. It's mainly found in the Swedish marshlands. If you can't get hold of cloudberry jam, you can easily replace it with raspberry or any jam you prefer. And there you have it. Butternut squash waffles with two little toppings. Parsnips in a cake might be rather unusual, but they'll make a delicious addition to my praline and parsnip cake, adding a natural sweetness and a subtle nuttiness. I'm going to top and tail my parsnips, peel off the tough skin. Finely grating the parsnips help them dissolve into the cake batter. I'm going to mix together my dry ingredients. Now, I'm using wholemeal flour. It's not what you normally use for baking, but I actually like that nutty flavour. And some ground powdered hazelnuts. Pinch of salt. A little bit of cinnamon. And some baking powder. Just want to mix all your dry ingredients together. Don't want any lumps of baking powder in your mixture. Parsnip goes in. Mix that all together. I'm now going to whisk up some eggs and sugar. And then you just want to whisk it until it's light and fluffy. Add some oil, vegetable oil or any non-flavoured oil. Add your dry ingredients and then fold it in gently. Try not to over mix, otherwise you'll beat all the air out. In it goes in the cake tin. Put the cake in a preheated oven at 180 degrees fan. For about half an hour. You know the cake is done when you can gently press it and it bounces back. Cake looks perfect. While the cake cools, I'm going to make my praline. You want to make sure your hazelnuts are blanched without the skin because the skin will add a bitterness to your praline otherwise. They're toasting up nicely. You can see they're getting a little bit of colour and they're releasing the lovely oils and it smells good too. I'm going to put them on a tray to cool down. For the caramel, you need some caster sugar and then sprinkle it into the pan in an even layer. The easiest way to make caramel is to do it in a light coloured pan because you can see the colour of the sugar. When you're making caramel, there are two important things. Don't leave the caramel unattended. And then also, you don't want to stir it. So if you stir caramel, then you agitate the sugar crystals and that will make your caramel lump up. All right, I'm going to turn it off the heat now because it will continue to cook. Pop in your hazelnuts. And work quickly here because the caramel cools down really quickly. While this is cooling, I'm going to make a simple cream cheese frosting. Soft butter, sugar and cream cheese. Mm. 
Once the caramel and the hazelnuts have cooled down, you can blitz it up into a coarse kind of powder. I quite like it when it's kind of a mixture of textures. Time to assemble the cake. I'm going to cut the cake in half. Tiny bit of icing on the bottom of the plate just to stick the cake down. Cake top and then the rest of the icing. And then a little bit of icing on the sides, just enough to make the praline stick. So just take a handful and sprinkle it on the side. I'm going to do a little Swedish nature landscape with my cake. A little tree in the background. And a final dusting of icing sugar. Okay, it's a little bit cheesy, but who doesn't love a little bit of cheese? My praline parsnip cake. I really get to see Sweden from its best side, traveling around and visiting wonderful farmers and passionate entrepreneurs who inspire new ways of cooking traditional Swedish dishes. This is the city of Malmo, situated just across the water from Copenhagen and only a 20-minute drive from the Danish capital. Despite Malmo being seen by many as Copenhagen's smaller sister town, it has a cosmopolitan and vibrant feel like any large city around the world, mainly due to its rich immigrant population. One of the many benefits to immigration is food. Falafel may now be sold all over the world, but here in Malmo, it's become a cheap favorite with the locals. Let's try some falafel. Yeah, let's do that. Can we have two falafel, please? Fantastic. At one of the local falafel stores, I'm meeting Linda Dahl, who's actually a Fika expert. But before we get to coffee and cookies, we need some Malmo food. So I heard in Malmo, falafel is really popular. It is. It's, um, you could say it's almost like a Malmo's national dish. We're like 177 nationalities living in Malmo. And Regardless of religion, regardless of if you're a vegan or a meat eater, or if you're rich or poor, you can always have a falafel. It's sort of a unifying dish for the people in Malmö. And I think that's why it's been so popular. Ah, oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. so delicious. It's all about the mixture. You have this really crispy falafel, and then you have the balance between the salad and the pickled cucumber, and of course, the sauces. Super mm. crunchy falafel. Mm. Yeah. You can say that falafel is a kind of vegetarian meatball, and that gives me an idea for my next dish. The English have fish and chips, the French have kokova, and the Swedes have meatballs. My versions of vegetarian meatballs just as delicious. I'm going to start off by soaking some porcini. Porcini is a wild forest mushroom with a nutty flavour. And that's really going to be the backbone of the flavour. While that's soaking, you need to let it soak for about half an hour. I'm going to fry an onion and some mushrooms. The button mushrooms are going to add texture to the bean balls. So while that's cooking, I'm going to whisk together my other ingredients. I've got some allspice, some ground flax seeds. Now, the flax seeds, what they will do, they will bind everything. So a bit like how you'd use an egg. And then black beans. They've been drained. Kidney beans. They've been drained too also got 100 millilitres of the liquid you get in the tin of beans. That's got starch in it and that will help bind everything. Black pepper. Plenty of it. Don't be shy. Salt. And then you just want to mash it all together. And 
Make sure you keep an eye on your mushrooms and onions. Don't want them to burn. OK, so that's got the consistency I want. It's like a textured kind of paste. I'm going to set that aside. Now, to my bean balls, I'm obviously going to serve a mash, but it's not going to be regular potato mash. I'm going to make a cauliflower and butter bean mash. Just want to get equal size florets so they steam evenly. So you want to steam your cauliflower for about 10 minutes until the florets are tender. Now, my bean balls need a few other ingredients. Some breadcrumbs. So I've got my mushroom and onion mix, which has got a lovely caramel colour to it. This is going to add a fantastic flavour to my bean balls. Then I'm going to add my porcini. So with the porcini, you want to save the liquid it's been soaking in because that's going to make the base for our gravy. Finally chop your porcini. You want to mix everything together until it's all well combined. It shouldn't end up with a very sticky kind of dough. Get your pan nice and hot, add a little bit of oil and then you can form your balls. I didn't realise how popular Swedish meatballs were until I moved here. Pops up everywhere, from the nursery, school canteens, at work, at home. Now I just need to fry the bean balls. Make sure it's nice and hot. So what you want to do is just Caramelise, crisp up the bottom. You can see it's turning a lovely golden brown colour. I'm going to pop them on the baking tray and into a warm oven just to keep warm while I make my gravy and finish off my mash. Cover them up before you put them in the oven. To make your gravy, you're going to need that porcini liquid from earlier. To thicken up my gravy, I'm going to need some cornstarch. Just add a little bit in there to make a paste. I'm going to use the same pan as I used to fry my bean balls to make the gravy because it has all that lovely flavour in there. Stir in the cornstarch. A teaspoon of yeast extract. This is going to add that depth of flavour. Finish it off with some black pepper, cream and a little bit of lemon juice. Just a few drops. Now, last thing to do is the butter bean and cauliflower mash. And then we have everything. Cauliflower's done. And then I've got these already cooked butter beans. They go in two. Some cream, of course. White pepper. Unlike mashed potato, you don't have to worry about over mashing it. As always, have a little taste. Mmm. Delicious. Right, all I need to do is assemble all the different components together. Generous dollop of mash. Bean balls. Cucumbers. You can use good quality store-bought pickled cucumbers. Gravy. The lingonberries. Don't forget that part. If you don't have lingonberries, you can serve it with red currant or cranberry jelly. Last but not least, a sprig of dill. And that's it to my Swedish bean balls. Often the tastiest dishes are the ones that use the simplest ingredients, like my stewed spinach eggs, or as I like to call them, my Swedish green shashuka. Now for my dish, I'm going to make a spicy red garnish. 
can add as little or as much as you like. And if you don't want it as spicy, take out the seeds. Red onion. If you haven't had shashuka before, it's a dish originally from uh, Tunisia. It's a rich tomato sauce with onions and spices and you crack eggs into them and you cook it in a pan. So instead of tomato sauce, I'm using traditional Swedish stewed spinach. So that's why it's green. Now to take the bite off the red onion and the chili, I'm going to make a pickle. Some white wine vinegar. Pinch of salt. A pinch of sugar. And then a couple of tablespoons of water. Give that a little stir. And just let that sit while you make the rest of your other ingredients. For my stewed spinach, I'm going to chop an onion. Add some butter to your pan. Then you can add your onions. Just want to gently fry this. You're softening the onions at this point. You're not caramelising them. What I love about this dish is it's mainly ingredients you might have in the freezer or in the fridge already. Nothing too exotic, but so simple to put together. To my softened onions, I'm going to add some frozen spinach. And I'm going to cover that up and let it cook covered for five minutes. So you can see the spinach has melted. It's a little bit watery at this point, so you need to cook it for about five to ten minutes uncovered to evaporate all the excess water. Now that the spinach has reduced down and it's not watery anymore, I'm going to add my milk and cream. Cream. Lots of white pepper. Be generous with your seasoning. Salt. And then some nutmeg. I really love this flavour, so I tend to put quite a bit in. Don't be shy, be bold. Give it a gentle stir, and you're ending up with this lovely, thick, creamy stewed spinach. So you could eat this just like that, but I'm going to add some eggs into it. it makes a perfect brunch dish or a light dinner. Great for sharing with friends and family. Lot of sake. I'm going to cover that, cook it for about five minutes until the egg whites are set. While that's cooking, I'm going to toast some bread. Need some dill and chives. You know when the eggs are done is when the egg whites have set. Not quite there yet. This looks like it's done. So I'm going to add my chilli onion garnish. It's kind of essential. You could do it without, but if you don't have this, it's missing that little kick. And then a few sprigs of dill on top of the garnish. A sprinkle of salt on your eggs. Hot toast needs some butter, of course. And then all that's left to do is to take a piece of toast and dip it in the egg yolk. That's the best bit. Mm. It's time for Fika, and I'm meeting up with Linda Dahl again. She knows everything about Swedish Fika. Coffee, tea? Coffee. OK. Coffee. Well, I'm going to be English. Yeah. <laughs> Cup of tea. Yeah. After the Finns, Swedes drink the most coffee in the world with an average of over 1,200 cups of coffee per person per year. I don't know. OK, all right. Well, like, is it that <laughs> no, bad? No, I will no, order no. a coffee. No, no. It's all right to have a cup of tea. The concept of Fika is simple. 
it is the moment that you take a break, often with a cup of coffee and a baked treat. You can do it alone, but most often with friends and family. We tend to see Swedish fika as almost as a human right. And fika is supposed to take time. You're yeah. supposed to gossip, connect with friends and family. The fika break is really important. It is mandatory. So what do you want to begin with? I think we should just start with the Damsugar, the Hoover, the bright green marzipan. Is there a reason why it's called a vacuum cleaner? This is a no-waste cake. So you take the, the old scrapes of biscuit and you sort of... Uh... <laughs> You're really selling it while I'm eating it. <laughs> it tastes great. And then we have chocolate bolles. <laughs> yeah, chocolate ball. It's basically just oat, butter, mm -hmm. cocoa powder, cocoa yeah. Cocoa powder um, and sugar. Very simple ingredients, the one you can make with your kids. It's the first thing that the kids learn here in Sweden to bake. I think that is chocolate balls. And then these, these are actually one of my favourites. I don't know why it's called Sarah. Well, I'm not really sure. I know who Sarah Berner was. She was a French actress, but maybe this because the French culture have sort of inspired Sweden a lot during the history, the same as British culture. Mm, well, it's a bit like Pavlova was inspired by a ballerina. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how you broke into it. It's a bit hard. I might just bite into it because it's yeah. like a macaroon at the bottom with yeah. a buttercream and then a like chocolate topping, isn't it? Yes, it is. Mmm. Nice. Let's talk about the princess tartar. Yeah. <laughs> the famous princess tartar. They even know about it in England now. They do? Yes. This is the most famous Swedish, apart from cannabis, cinnamon buns kind of cake. Yeah, I can understand that. Uh, when uh, the Princess Victoria here in Sweden had her first child, mm -hmm. the princess cake sold out that day. 70% of every cake that's, that are sold in bakery shops are princess cake. So it's really popular. I'm going to tuck in. Yeah, do. It's, um, it's just so light and fluffy. It is. It is um, a sponge cake. Mm. And then you have this um, fluffy whipped cream. And you have layers of um, creme anglaise. In this version, you also have a raspberry uh, marmalade. You're actually not supposed to have that in the green one. You're allowed to have it in the pink one. But we're, we're being just... controversial. Yeah, yeah, and modern. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I like how Swedes like to break the rules. Ooh, we're going to have some <laughs> raspberry, raspberry marmalade in the green princess cake. <laughs> in Sweden, there is morning fika, after lunch fika, afternoon fika and sometimes even evening fika. Though most Swedes might not sit down and relax with a cup of coffee four times a day, they do have fika once or twice. A typical Swedish biscuit has to be havreflan. Oh my goodness, I can't speak Swedish, <laughs> forget it. It's oat cookies, basically. Really simple, crunchy, very satisfying. My version is a little bit different to the traditional version, which uses sugar, flour, oats. I'm gonna use bananas, very ripe ones, to sweeten the biscuit. The riper they are, the better. So the bananas, you really don't want to eat anymore. They're perfect. Pinch of salt, teaspoon of ground vanilla, and then some oats. Mix that all together till you have a slightly wet oat dough. Baking tray lined with baking paper, and then a cookie cutter, roughly about six centimeters wide. So just take some of the oat dough and then press it into your cookie cutter to make a round. So you want the cookies to be a couple millimetres thick and even. It's really important they're even because then they'll bake evenly. Just repeat until you've filled the tray. The last cookie's done. I've preheated my oven to 220 degrees, really hot oven. And they're going to go in for about 10 to 15 minutes and then you need to flip them over. So the biscuits are done. You can see they're done because they've got lovely golden edges. 
and they sound crisp. You could eat them just like they are, keep them in an airtight container, they'll keep for a couple of days, or dip them in some chocolate. I'm gonna melt some chocolate. I'm using dark chocolate, but you could use milk chocolate if you'd like. My chocolate has melted. I'm just gonna give it a little dip, like so. If you find the chocolate too hot to handle, just use a spoon to spread on the chocolate. Now, what I like to do is sprinkle a little bit of finishing salt on my chocolate. It just brings out that chocolate flavour, makes these biscuits extra special. It's not a traditional touch, but it's extremely delicious. Five ingredients is all you need for my oat cookies. Banana, oats, chocolate, vanilla, and a pinch of salt. Malmo, with its large immigrant population, has a rich and diverse food scene, which I thoroughly enjoyed exploring. It reflects Sweden of today and potentially Sweden of the future. Gothenburg is the second largest city in Sweden and the only major city with the Atlantic Ocean as its coastline. From here it is open water all the way to the tip of Scotland. Naturally, fishing has always been very important here. The herring is Sweden's favourite fish. Lately, it has seen its popularity challenged by farmed salmon from Norway. But still, herring is the most Swedish of all fish. If it's not pickled, it's usually breaded and fried. Here in Gothenburg, it is sold on the street as fast food. Hey, hey! Strömming, hemlagert, mos och lingon. Yeah. So strömming is? Herring, fried herring. OK, fried herring with homemade mashed potatoes and lingonberry. Yeah. Sounds great. I'll have one of those. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There you go. Oh, wow, this looks delicious. And look at the uh, herring. It, the breadcrumbs look so crispy. Yeah. But it, it's not just breadcrumbs, it's that no, it's dill. it's dill, yeah. Yeah. And salt and white pepper. Mmm. I love the coating on the fish. It's so crunchy. This is Feskerskirke, which means fish church in the local dialect. It was built in 1874 and served as a fish auction until 1910. The church-like windows gave the building its name. On the second floor is a restaurant where, according to its owner, the best shrimp sandwich in the world can be found. I think we're going to make a traditional Swedish uh, rekmaka. Rekmaka. Yeah, prawn sandwich. So we've got our shrimps, prawns, we've got a boiled egg, we've got some saddle leaves. This is a mayonnaise or... It is. Yeah, mayonnaise. And that's it. And, it's, uh, and there's some lemon there as well. We're going to make it together. Yeah. Super easy. Take the bread. Should I butter it? Yeah, yeah, butter it. More. More, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. You're... Like basically everything. And I, I, I <laughs> <What>? start... <laughs> Yeah, we love, yeah, butter is good. You know how you put butter on and when you bite in it, you see your teeth marks? I love that. Yes. OK, then I, I, then I understand how much butter you want on there. Yeah. Okay. Because the butter is, yeah. is kind of salty and it's fat. All right. And the shrimps, mm -hmm. as, as you felt, they're, they're actually a little bit sweet. So this is a very popular sandwich in Sweden, isn't it? It is. It is the sandwich to order. They pop up everywhere. They pop up everywhere. Like, I've even seen it at, like, a corner shop, like a newsagent. Like, I never buy a shrimp sandwich. This is, this is like the shrimp sandwich I would do home. What you do is, like, it's the perfect couch food. You just bring everything you need. Mm -hmm. You can do it as you're watching TV or yeah. whatever and, and share a good bottle of wine or two. Or... But the technique, and especially this time of the year, yeah. when they're developing the, the row, yeah. The roe is in, under the belly, yeah. the roe is still in the head, so I like the taste of the roe. So what mm -hmm. I do is that I take the, just the top of the head, oh, so I get okay. the roe lift, 
And then we take the, the beard. Yeah. And off with that. Yeah. And then underneath the belly. And then just give it a gently squeeze yeah. on the tail. And you, wow. you should have a... Amazing. I just learned to how to peel pork. <laughs> Okay, so we do one layer of mayonnaise yeah. on top, and then we cover everything up with uh, some salad leaves. Yeah, and more mayonnaise. Yes, I like because we don't want the shrimps to when you, when you bite it, you don't want the shrimps to just fall off. Oh, you want yeah. them to be a little bit sticked in there. They should glue on. Yeah, and I take your egg and the Put Swedish in invention. <laughs> Is it Swedish? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I, you just made I it hoped. up. The egg slicer. The egg slicer. Beautiful boiled egg. Okay, so we've got bread, we've got a nice layer of salty butter, mm -hmm. we've got some mayonnaise, we've got a lettuce leaf, and then we've got some more mayonnaise and we've got some egg. Shrimps. Shrimps. Is the, com the combination's right on the shrimp sandwich. Oh, it's lovely. It does, isn't it? Yeah. Very, very appetizing. I think once you've had one of these shrimp sandwiches, you'll never be able to have like a regular shrimp no. sandwich, will you? No. What do you call this? Dill. Crown dill. Crown dill. Yes, because it's like the dill at the top. Oh, the final touch. How Swedish. This looks beautiful. Mmm. Wow. That layer of butter makes a difference. It's good, eh? Yeah. You are definitely right to be so generous. Mm. Worth all that hard work of peeling. Well done. Though people in Gothenburg swear by their prawns and how to eat seafood the right way, I suspect that even the holy prawn sandwich can be done slightly differently. Seems like everyone in Sweden has their version of prawns on toast, and here's mine. I'm gonna do a party version. So we're going to use pumpernickel bread. Pumpernickel is a dark, slightly sweet rye bread, but you can use sourdough or any bread of your preference. Perfect bite-sized pieces. I'm going to toast them. Well, that's toasting away. I'm going to make my topping. A little bit of mayonnaise. Creme fraiche. Some salt. Dijon mustard for a bit of heat. You can add as little or as much as you like. White pepper. Mix that together. Prawns already peeled. Make your life easier. A little bit of dill. Dill is a herb I always associate with Sweden. It comes up so often. That goes in. Save a little bit for later. Give that a little stir. Going to check on the toast now. Before I top these, I need a little bit of butter. I'm putting on slightly less butter as I have a rich dressing on the prawns. Try and get the prawns on the toast. It doesn't need to be too much of a heap. People should be able to pop these into their mouth quite easily. Now I've got an extra special touch a little bit of Carlix low rum. So it's a fish row from the north of Sweden. Looks like little beads. Adds a bit of sweetness. Sweetness and saltiness at the same time. Now, one last thing. You've got the orange going on, but we need a tiny bit more green. A few finely chopped chives. Just makes everything pop. A simple little starter for your party. In the small village called Assiga on the Swedish west coast is Gudsman's Garden. It is a small pig farm started 20 years ago by Ralph and his wife. So there's been an increase in interest yes, of over course. the years? In these 20 years here in Sweden, we see that people are more and more interested in food quality. And now people want to have local varieties, as a local produced with a historical uh, connection. Fantastic, mm -hmm. but they look so happy. Yes, yes. 
Pigs are very social. They are yeah. not aggressive. They like playing and lying and in the mud. And you see also these tails. Yeah. Normal why industrial farming yeah. pigs have no tails. You okay. take these tails yeah. because they are so aggressive, they eat each other. All right. But here, every pig has his tail. We have responsibility also for these animals here. And if these animals are happy, it's also good for me and my family. I say, we have a good job. Yeah. We must save the family farming in whole Europe. This is so important that not everything becomes industrial. <laughs> we do this now in 20 years yeah. and it is working. So what type of pig are these? Oh, this is a, a mixture between Swedish land race yeah. and Hampshire. A and British very race. Very old British race, Hampshire. What do they eat? Pigs are all eaters, like human beings. And so they get also uh, a mixture of uh, barley, oat and rye plus beans. But they also eat what's found here. Yes, yes. So the meat is kind Some of... Some worms, insects. No? Yeah, influenced so, no? by yeah. the flavour of this land in Yes, Sweden. that's right. Same with Spain, with Pata Negra ham. Uh, or in Parma, this is ham from Italy. They say, oh, this is typical Italy, this is typical Spain. And now we can say, this is typical Swedish. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I mean, what a beautiful yes, yes. countryside. Yes, yes. You can see, see they're having the pool, they're lying in the pool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having their spa time. Yeah. So I need some pork mince. Yes, this we can fix because it's quite fresh. Here we have it. Fantastic. And I also get some of the um, smoked bacon. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy pigs make good quality meat. I'm off back to my cabin to cook up a traditional Swedish dish, the Wallenberger. It's named after one of Sweden's most well-known industrial families. Naturally, I'll be putting my own twist on this classic and taking some inspiration from fast food. There's nothing worse than a dry, rubbery burger. That's definitely not the case with my Wallenberger at Burgers. I'm gonna start off by making my burger patties. Now, the key to this burger patty is using really rich, indulgent ingredients. You need either some pork mince, or traditionally you would use veal mince, cream, four egg yolks. The egg yolks and cream are gonna add that richness to the burger. The egg whites you can save to make a meringue. You can even freeze them in an airtight container. They'll keep for a couple months. Generous pinch of salt and lots of white pepper. And then you just want to blend everything together. I'm going to put the mixture in a bowl and that's going to go into the fridge for about an hour. You want the mince to absorb the cream and the egg yolks. So my mixture's been sitting in the fridge. It's a bit easier to form now. I'm gonna roll it in some breadcrumbs. I'm gonna add a pinch of salt. Toss that through. And then form this into four patties. Dip it in the breadcrumbs, then flip it over to get the other side. And then pop it on a clean plate. last one. Right, you'll need a generous dollop of butter in a hot pan to fry your burgers. And when the butter's singing, you can add your patties. You want to fry the patties about four to five minutes on each side until they've got a golden crust. See here, it's got a lovely golden colour on them. Crispy too. I'm going to put them on a tray. They're rather thick patties, so they need to go in a preheated oven at 170 degrees for about five to ten minutes 
just to cook it all the way through. While the burgers are finishing in the oven, I'm gonna make my pea puree. I'm gonna add some salt to the boiling water. And another pinch, just for luck. Peas go in, I'm just using frozen peas. And this takes about five minutes to cook. Some lettuce, lingonberry jam, and I've got some brioche burger buns, which I'm gonna to toast on the fire. I think the peas are done. Let's have a quick look. Yeah, just gonna drain them. finish off my peas, I'm going to blitz them up with some butter, that's always good, a bit of salt and I have a bit of vegetable stock as well, just a little bit. And then you just need to blend it together. That looks spot on. Give your peas a little taste check if you need a bit more salt. Mmm, good. All that's left to do is to assemble everything. I'm using iceberg lettuce, a bit retro, but it's crisp. You don't want fancy rocket, it doesn't work for this. Some lingonberry jam. If you can't get hold of lingonberry jam, you can use cranberry or red currant jam. It's definitely not gonna be easy to eat. It's a big mouthful, but tasty. Look at that color. And then pop that on top. My Wallenberger burger, a twist on the Swedish classic. Klardkaka Swedish chocolate mud cake is super popular at dinner parties because it's easy to make. But what do you do when you have friends who have dietary restrictions? Well, you'll have to make my cake. It's just as tasty and easy to do. So I'm using some sticky sweet dates as my base. It's gonna add the sweetness. Put that in the blender. Some espresso. Now what the coffee does is bring out that chocolatey flavor. You want to blitz this until you have a smooth paste. All right. Now this cake is super easy because it's just about adding all your ingredients into the blender. So I've got some non-tasting vegetable oil. You could use coconut butter. Goes in. Some ground flax seeds. That's gonna bind everything together. Some black beans, not what you expect to have in a chocolate cake, but it will give it that muddy texture. A Little bit of the bean liquid. Some vanilla bean paste. Cocoa powder. Teaspoon of salt. And some baking powder. Okay, that's it. We've got our cake batter ready. I've got a baking tin already lined with some paper and you just need to pour in your mix. If you wanted to, you could do individual ones like in a muffin tin. They just take 10 minutes to bake versus a half an hour for the big one. Spread the mixture out. Then that goes in the oven preheated at 200 degrees for about half an hour. You know when the cake is done, if you pull out a skewer, and it should be slightly wet on the tip. You don't want it to be completely dry. The cake should feel a little bit muddy.
let my cake cool down a little bit. And while that cools, I'm gonna make a really easy icing using avocados. So normally you'd make icing with butter, but we're gonna do a vegan version, just as creamy. So the avocados add that creaminess. Really important you have super soft, ripe avocados. that in your blender. So this cake is vegan. There are no animal products in there. It's also nut free, refined sugar free. Basically it's free from many things, but not free from flavor. Okay, to my icing, I'm gonna add a pinch of salt, cocoa powder, and then the sweetener is gonna be maple syrup. You can add as much or as little as you like. Adjust it to your liking. That's it. Make sure your cake has cooled down first. So you just want to smooth the icing on the top. Okay, I'm gonna add some berries for color. It's quite nice to cut the strawberry in half. Some blueberries. And then I'm just gonna shave some chocolate on. My Swedish chocolate mud cake. One to please everyone. To visit people who believe so much in what they're doing is truly inspirational. Whether it's making the best prawn sandwich or raising the happiest pigs. The more I learn about Swedish food, the more intrigued I become. It's simple yet refined. Welcome to Smurgen. This beautiful little fishing village north of Gothenburg is the mecca for ocean fishing and partying. The summers are filled with tourists enjoying the finer things in life, like good food and wine, as well as the stunning scenery. Now it is the very end of the tourist season, and for many, this is the real Smurgen. Hey, Sixten! Hi, hey, hey. <laughs> Welcome! Thank you so much! It's the first day of this year's lobster season. I'm out on the sea with Sixten, and we're going to go fish for some lobsters. The excitement can be felt as every fisherman dream of catching the black gold of the ocean that sell for as much as 8,000 euro per kilo. The start of the lobster season is always seven o'clock the first Monday after September the 20th every year. What fabulous weather we have today. Typical sea weather, I think. I'm used to it. I've got my yellow Mac, so I'm all right. Let's hope the lobsters like it too. Hard work, Chris. <laughs> oh, wow! Woo! I like it! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I got some lobsters! First time lucky! Too small. So, bye bye! Not going in the pot today, you live another life. Bye bye, lobster. In you go. All lobsters smaller than nine centimetres or approximately three and a half inches from head to the beginning of its tail, as well as all lobsters with roe must be thrown back into the ocean. The big one. Massive. It's huge. It's a monster lobster. Yes, yes. Really, it's really very, big. Very good. <laughs> and look at the size of those claws. Yes. You don't want to put your fingers there. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it's pretty good. That will make one very tasty lobster. Yes. Thank you so much, Sixten. I will take this with me. You, you can. Give it a kiss! <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't want to get too attached to the lobster because I'm going to be cooking it. <laughs> 
Serving lobster doesn't mean you have to serve it with a fancy side. The humble cabbage turned into a lemon caraway cabbage salad will make a delicious accompaniment. This salad's inspired by a little takeaway salad you often get in Sweden with your pizza. It's citrusy, it has a nice kind of vinegary dressing to it. Simple, but quite tasty. So you want to take out the core of the cabbage, the tough bit. Just take out the core here. and then thinly slice it. Season your cabbage with a generous amount of salt and toss it well together. You almost want to massage the cabbage. All the slices of cabbage get coated with the salt. And what's going to happen is the salt draws out like the excess liquid and you end up with a really crunchy salad. So I'm going to let that sit for an hour. Now I'm going to make my dressing. I'm going to zest a lemon. Some olive oil. White wine vinegar. Black pepper. And a little bit of sugar to take the edge off. I'm going to just pour the dressing on top. Give that a little mix. Two other things I need. I'm going to toast some caraway seeds. And while they're toasting, I'm going to cut up my lemon. So you want to remove the pith because we're going to use the lemon flesh. Take out the white center and any extra seeds or pips you might see, and then roughly chop this up. That gets added to your salad. So you know when your caraway seeds are done is when you can actually smell them. So they go on top. Right, now for the lobster. Ask your fishmonger to prepare your lobster for you if you don't feel confident doing it yourself. Clean it up a little bit. And they're just going to go straight on the grill. If you don't have an open fire, what you could do is put it under the grill in the oven. Just make sure it's nice and hot. Langoustine or large prawns make a delicious alternative. I'm going to brush them with a little bit of butter. Really don't need much at this point. Keep it simple. Chop up some parsley for your garnish. Adds a bit of freshness to the dish too. A few lemon wedges to serve. I'm going to put my salad in the serving bowl. To my salad, I'm going to add a little bit of salmon roe. You don't have to, but I like that salty popping sensation you get from the salmon roe. Right, I think the lobster's done. Now, I deliberately didn't turn them over because I didn't want them to lose their juices. So what you're looking for is the flesh to go from translucent to opaque, and then you know it's done. So serve with a little bit of lemon, a sprinkling of finishing salt, and a tiny bit of parsley. And that's all you need to serve up a delicious lobster. When it comes to fika, there's so many more sweet treats you can choose from than the regular cinnamon bun. And one of my favourites is caucus topper or coconut macaroon. I'm going to melt some butter. And to the butter, I'm going to add some lemon zest. This is just going to bring a little bit of freshness. Sugar. And then half a teaspoon of salt. Give it a little mix. While that's melting, I'm going to toast my coconut. This is an important step. If you don't taste your coconut, you're not going to release all those lovely nutty flavours. Spread it out evenly. And you want to toast it until it's golden brown. You release all that lovely nutty aroma. Once your butter's melted, take it off the heat and let it cool down. Time to check on the coconut. Let's have a look. 
So the coconut, you can see it's toasted really nicely. You've got that lovely golden brown colour. And you can smell the toastiness. Now I'm going to mix together my other ingredients. Some ground almonds. And then a rather unusual addition, some sesame seeds. I added them because it was a happy accident. I didn't have enough ground almonds, so I thought I put sesame seeds in instead, and it actually works really well as another kind of dimension in terms of the nutty flavour. And then your toasted coconut. Then mix everything together. And now I can add my wet ingredients. Three eggs. And I'm just going to roughly incorporate that in before I add the melted butter. Now, when you add the melted butter, make sure it's cooled, because if it's not, then you might cook the eggs. And gently stir that together. Right, all mixed together. Time to roll up your sleeves. Gets a bit messy at this point. So you need to take a small amount, about the size of a golf ball, and form it into like little peaks, little mountains. Obviously, you could make them a lot larger, but I quite like them when they're just one or two mouthfuls. These are great little biscuits to make if you have friends who have a gluten allergy. There's no gluten in these. And they taste good. They're going to go in the oven preheated to 200 degrees for about half an hour. I'm going to coat my mountains with some white chocolate. Just want to roughly chop it up. Helps with the melting. If you're not into white chocolate, use dark chocolate. It's really up to you. I've got a bain-marie here, so a little bit of water at the bottom, a bowl to sit on top, and melt my chocolate. Be careful you don't let the water underneath boil, because if it's too hot, then what happens with the chocolate is it splits. They've got the perfect golden brown colour. And then if you turn them over, they should be caramelised on the bottom as well. OK, now the easiest way to coat them in chocolate is to do them while they're still warm. So make sure you've got your chocolate all melted and all you need to do is dip them in. So now they're starting to look like little mountains. Got the snow on the top. A little Swedish touch with some lingonberries. It's not what you normally put on, but I actually like the bright red pop, but also the lingonberries add a bit of acidity. If you don't have lingonberries, you can use red currants instead. And that's it. My white chocolate berry mountains. A little sweet alternative to a traditional cinnamon bun. Smurgen, with its 1,300 inhabitants, is called the liveliest summer town in Sweden. It's hard to imagine on a day like today, but if you come here for the food, this time of the year is best. Time for a little break to warm up. And what better way than to try a local favourite snack, an open fish sandwich. Tack! Time to tuck in. I have a Gravlux sandwich here. It was interesting, when I first moved to Sweden, I was trying to learn Swedish, which I still am today, and I used Swedish cookbooks as a way of learning the language. And I learned that the words Gravlux comes from grav, to bury, and you used to bury the salmon in the soil. Nowadays, you just bury it in a bed of salt and sugar and spices, and lux means salmon. Back to the cabin after another wonderful trip packed with lots of delicious food. Great for getting new recipe ideas. 
My Gravlax Poke Bowl is a Swedified version of this Hawaiian classic. It uses Gravlax flavors with Swedish garnishes for a delicious twist. So I've got a piece of salmon filet here. You just want to dab off any excess moisture in a clean tea towel, because that will affect the flavor of the salmon. So when you use a salmon filet, try and get a filet which is like even in terms of thickness. It just helps to equally distribute the brine. And then for the brine, I'm gonna do a mixture of flavors. So I've got some white peppercorns, lemon zest. You'll notice there's a bit of a theme with the flavors. There's always a bit of lemon zest involved. Some fresh dill. Finally chop that. Two ingredients you need for the Gravlax is salt and sugar because that will make your brine slightly sweet and salty at the same time. You're literally going to bury the salmon in the salt and sugar. So it's a sweet and savory brine and the salt goes into. Mix it together. And then you need a resealable food bag. And just tip it in there. Salmon goes in. Make sure your bag is well sealed. And then it's time for a little massage. So this is a fairly quick brine. You don't need to do this overnight. Just takes a couple hours in total. So once the sugar and salt is well massaged into the salmon, you can set it aside for 40 minutes at room temperature, and then you can put it in the fridge. We need to turn the salmon over so the brine infuses both sides. While that's brining, I'm gonna cook some rice, hot stock. And the rice goes in, cover that up. While that's cooking away, I can prepare my garnish. I'm using a mandolin, but if you don't have a mandolin, a sharp knife will do. So I have some beetroot ready cooked. If you don't want to get pink fingers, use gloves. Right, so give your mandolin a quick rinse. So same thing with the radishes. If you don't have radishes and beetroot in the fridge, you could use other vegetables. A carrot would be just as nice. Some sliced cabbage. It's really whatever you find in the fridge. I need half a lemon for later, but I can slice some wedges up now. Now, the important part. I need to make my Gravlax dressing. And the dressing is inspired by the dressing you have for Gravlax, which is a sweet mustard, a bit of honey. I like to add some Dijon mustard just to give it a bit more of a kick and some oil to bring everything together. Dijon mustard, a little bit of honey, the runny kind makes it easier. Sunflower oil, basically oil which doesn't have a strong taste, so extra virgin olive oil is not the oil you want to use in this dressing. Some lemon juice, squeeze that in. Some salt, and don't forget a little bit of dill for this as well. Finely chop it. Give your jar a shake to mix all your ingredients together. Have a little taste. Always good to taste it on something that's how you're going to eat it anyway. Mmm, perfect. Right, so I've got my dressing, I have my garnishes, just need to peel my horseradish. This bit is what I love the most, it's that spiciness you're going to add to the dish. 
It's very similar to adding some wasabi to your poke bowl. I'm gonna grate some of this. This has been sitting at room temperature for enough time, so I'm gonna put it in the fridge until I need it. Time to get the salmon out the fridge. Before you can use it, you need to give it a little rinse. Otherwise, it'll be too salty and too sweet. So you want to give it a little pat down and remove any excess moisture. So you can actually feel how the brine has changed the texture of the fish. It's become a lot firmer, denser, colours slightly intensified. So you just want to slice even slices. Don't make it too thin, don't make it too thick. So I've got like about just over half a centimetre there. So that usually helps to have a very sharp knife when you're doing this. Okay, now it's all about bringing everything together. Rice. I got some of the beetroot, some radishes, and then I have some of my favorite Swedish pickles from the fridge. So I've got pink pickled onions and some pickled cucumber. They really add that extra Swedish touch to the dish. To make your own pickled cucumbers, bring 400 millilitres of water, 300 millilitres of vinegar, 100 grams of sugar, 30 grams of salt, and a bunch of fresh dill to the boil. Stir and leave to cool before adding 750 grams of sliced cucumbers. Store in a sterilised jar. Don't forget the salmon. Give your dressing a little stir before you put it on. Bit of a spicy note with the horseradish. Put as much or as little as you like. And then one last touch, a sprig of dill. And that's my Swedified Hawaiian version of a poke bowl. With the open water in the west and the Baltic Sea in the east, it's no wonder that so much Swedish cuisine includes fish and seafood. But to finish it off with a sweet coconut chocolate and berry mountain is not bad either. The region of Småland in the southeast of Sweden is filled with woods and lakes. This was a poor area inhabited by hardy people, loggers, fishermen and farmers. During the large immigration to America in the 19th and 20th century, over 20% of all Swedes left for the United States, many of them from this region. In the middle of Småland, I'm meeting Magnus Neiman who is taking me crayfishing in the same lake his father and grandfather caught these delicious lobster-like creatures. When did you start crayfishing? How old were you? Actually, I've been doing this really, really long time. My grandfather, he had this small farm. Uh-huh. And then planted crayfish. Oh, wow. Really. So I've been crayfishing since I was really, really little. Yeah, I think we've got enough fish now to bait, don't we? We have, yes. Yeah. Right. OK, this is the cage. Yeah, so the little yellow boxes Yes. is what we're going to fill with the fish. Like one, that's enough. Half a fish Half will a do fish. it. Right, let's do some crayfishing. Of course. <laughs> Eating crayfish is something the Swedes have in common with people from Louisiana in the United States, but not with the rest of Scandinavia. We have put bait in the crayfish cages and we'll place them in the shallow well, part. I prepared this one oh, for you. Oh, thank you very much. The cages are left in the water overnight before being pulled up. Luckily, Magnus put them out the day oh, before. Oh, wow! Quite a lot. Yeah, loads. Look Fantastic. at that. Wow, that one's huge. Do you see this one here? Yeah, that's was a good one. A bit angry. It is very angry. I don't want to get my fingers in between those claws. <laughs> I think we've done pretty well. I think so too. In Sweden, crayfish are boiled in dill and eaten cold. Everyone has their own special recipe. We're heading back to an inn that Magnus manages, where he will show me his recipe. 
Okay, Magnus, we're going to cook some crayfish. Just How are we going to cook them? We have this crown dill, we okay. have the uh, dark beer, we have some sugar, and we have this salt, and we will make this magic so it will turn them into red. Right, well, let's get cracking. Yeah. Traditionally, crayfish are cooked for a couple minutes until they turn red and then removed. The brine is cooled before the crayfish is added back to the brine and left overnight to soak up more of the flavour. Fabulous! Let's go have a taste. Fantastic. I was taught you have to eat it like this. Yes, it's important. That's where you taste all the delicious yes. dill and yep. the beer from the brine. School and tak so much. Tak for your <laughs> Thank you for having me. Mmm. You have to have beer with crayfish. I think so. Yeah. And a little glass of schnapps sometimes. If you too. like singing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Crayfish are part and parcel of the Swedish year. August and September being the time you fish them. One of the best ways to eat them is in the form of a soup. I've got some pre-cooked crayfish here and I'm going to shell them. Langoustine or even large prawns can be substituted for the crayfish. I'm going to keep the claws whole because they'll look really beautiful for the decoration. It's really the tail which is the meaty part. Don't discard the shells, we're going to use them for the stock. The majority of the flavour is in the shell. I think my favourite Swedish celebration has to be a crayfish party. Going out, fishing for the crayfish, and then cooking them. And then the fun bit is obviously eating them with friends and family, singing, drinking schnapps. Crayfish is all peeled. And now I'm just going to make my base for the soup. I need one carrot. Finely chop your carrot. Stick of celery. Same procedure. And finally, an onion. I'm going to get my pot nice and hot. A little bit of oil in there. Your carrots, your celery and your onion. Give it a little stir. You're just softening the onions at this point, no caramelisation. Pinch of cayenne pepper. Some paprika. Tomato paste. You're basically frying this until the onion's soft. I'm going to add some white wine. And then I'm going to add the shells. They've got all of that lovely crayfish flavour in there. Give that a good stir. Some hot fish stock. A little bit of white pepper. A couple of bay leaves. All you need to do at this point is let it simmer for about half an hour so the stock reduces and intensifies in flavour. Leave it uncovered. So, as you can see, the stock has simmered down, it's reduced, the flavours have intensified and we've got this amazing bright red colour. I'm going to remove the shells and all the little bits in the soup. Now you want to put the soup back into the pot. And then I'm just draining the last bit of the stock away. Some double cream. Save a little bit for the garnish. A touch of salt. All that's left to do is stir in the bits of crayfish meat and prep your garnish. A few chives. Time to serve. Don't forget the crayfish claws. A sprinkle of chives. Before I forget, a splash of cream. That's all you need for your crayfish party. Vestavotten cheese has to be my favourite Swedish cheese. It's hearty, packed with flavour, great to eat on its own, perfect in a pie. 
I'm going to make my pastry for the pie. Need some plain flour. Pinch of salt. A tablespoon of mustard. It's not what you normally put in pastry, but this gives it an extra flavour. Cold butter. And now you just want to rub the butter and flour through your fingers to make a sandy texture. This is why it's super important to have cold butter. If the butter's slightly warm, it'll start to melt. When you have that crumbly texture, I'm going to add some vodka. What that does is not add an alcoholic flavour, but actually keep the pastry flaky. Vodka will help bring the dough together without developing the gluten, unlike water, as the alcohol evaporates during the baking process. I'm going to roll out my pastry between two sheets of baking paper. It's better to do it this way than flouring your work surface, flouring your dough and rolling it out in flour. That way you minimise the amount of additional flour you add to your dough. Also, it's super easy just to move your dough around. The pastry should be rolled out so it's larger than your pie tin. Now, once you've rolled out your pastry to the right size, it's going to go in the fridge for 30 minutes. So my pastry is chilled for half an hour. I'm going to put it in my tin. Make sure you tuck right into the edges there. Push it down a little bit. Then I'm going to take the rolling pin. Just run the rolling pin around the tin. Brick the base. This stops air bubbles forming in the pastry base. And then put in some baking paper, important part. And I'm going to use some dried chickpeas as baking weights. Bake at 160 degrees fan for 20 minutes before removing the baking weights. And bake for a further 10 minutes or until the base is firm and dry. I'm going to make my filling for the cheese pie. And for that you need lots of cheese. Best of Boston cheese. You can use mature cheddar, comte or any other flavour packed hard cheese. Cream. and then three eggs. Generous pinch of salt. Lots of black pepper. Mix that all together. I'm gonna add an onion. Not what you normally do, but it's a nice addition. Just need to get my pie crust out of the oven. Pour in your egg mixture. Top the pie with the onions. And then that goes in a preheated oven at 180 degrees for 25 to 30 minutes. To my Vesterbottom pie, I'm going to do a chanterelle topping. Once the butter is sizzling away, you can add your mushrooms. We chop the parsley. Add a pinch of salt to your mushrooms. Vesterbottom pie usually makes appearances at midsummer, crayfish parties, Christmas, but I actually really like having a slice with some fresh green salad. Don't need to serve it for a special occasions. So the easiest way to remove the ring off the pie is to Put it on something high and then you can just slide it off like that. Let's slide this onto my plate. Pile your chanterelle on top. Sprinkle on the pasty. I think Vesterbotten pie has to be one of my favourite Swedish dishes. And I'm sure it will be yours too. Just try and make it. I'm on my way to the Costa Border Glass Factory. Glass has been blown in these parts since the 16th century. The dense forest provided perfect fuel for the glass blowing fires. The workers used to live at the factories and after a hard day's work, they got together and used the ovens that were still hot to cook their dinners. But before I get to taste some traditional glass factory food, I will try to blow some glass. 
Wow, look at that. Nicholas Frode is a master glass blower and will be my teacher. In the bucket there, you grab one of those blocks. Yeah. Shape the glass. Okay. Yeah. And then you put the, the block back yeah. and add a little bit of water on the newspaper. Swedish newspaper. And you yeah. put it in your hand, like that, and yeah, you shape the glass. Oh, wow. With your hand without getting burned. That's amazing. Of course, it has to be Swedish newspaper. Absolutely. <laughs> you will blow and yeah. turn, turn at the at same the time. time. So, yeah. Right. The more you blow, the thinner it gets. So, it will also cool down quicker. Woo! Takes a little bit of practicing. And yeah, but how long have you been blowing glass? For about 30 years. Yeah. So. But what's really interesting about this region of Sweden, Småland, there's a long history of making glasses. Yeah, well, the reason why they put the glass factories here is because they they use uh, the wood for um, firing up the furnaces and you have the, the lakes with the sand, the sand mm -hmm. for making the, the raw material through the glass. And it's being really resourceful, mm. which I heard you're also very resourceful with the way you use the heat from the furnaces afterwards to cook food. Exactly, yeah. Well, I think we should go try the food. Do <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> The tradition of cooking together at the end of a hard day glass blowing lives on even today. The word for it, hutsil, means cabin herring. So we've got baked potatoes, yeah. some bacon, and then, ah, what's this? This is isteband, like pork sausages. So this is a, a local sausage which is very much from the Smallland region. Yeah. It, it's starting to look like an English breakfast. It does <laughs> <laughs> Just need my fried egg on the Don't side. The <laughs> <laughs> What's this? This is the herring. OK. Yeah. So it's got herring, onions... Cream, I guess. Cream, yeah. yeah, and some dill. Goes well with the potato. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to try some of the herring. Mm. Mm. It's nice and salty. It's nice and mm. salty. Now for some of this local sausage. It smells delicious, really smoky um, flavours. Mmm. That's delicious. It is. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, look, we should have a little score. A little score, yeah. yeah. That's... It's good. It's good. Sorry, I can't down it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the real Swedish, like, yeah. down it in one. Not hard enough. <laughs> After standing up for the main food, we sat down for dessert. Smallland is known for its cheesecake, which is light and fluffy and served with jam. So Oskarke is something I hadn't heard of before I'd moved to Sweden. OK, It's yeah. something which doesn't really travel beyond Sweden. Uh, Ost is cheese and Karke is cake, mm -hmm. so it's... So it should be a cheesecake. Cheesecake. But... And it's warm. It is warm as well. So mm. Makes it even a little bit more tastier. Feels you like, like it? Yeah, I love it. Mm. It feels like this is a real grandma dessert. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Nicholas, for letting me come blow some glass and eat some delicious food. The cheesecake is nothing like the traditional cheesecake. It has a distinct taste that is uniquely Scandinavian. I cannot wait to try my own version of this Swedish classic. Ostkaka, Swedish cheesecake from Småland. It's rich and creamy with a slight semolina texture and an almond aroma. Definitely worth trying. I'm going to make a fresh cheese base, which is very simple. Some flour. And then you want to whisk in a little bit of milk to make a paste. Now, it's important to put the flour in first and slowly stir in the milk, otherwise you'll get lumps. Make a sort of wallpaper paste, and then you can whisk in the rest of the milk. And then I'm going to add some rennet. Now, rennet is something you can usually find at the chemist or some specialised grocery stores. And basically what rennet does is make the milk separate into whey and curds. Whey is the liquid remaining when you curd all your milk. Curd are the milk solids which are strained to make the cheesecake. You want to gently stir the mixture and raise the temperature to about 37 degrees. 37 degrees Celsius is warm enough that you can put your finger in without burning yourself. So, the mixture has separated into whey and curds. I'm going to let that sit for half an hour 
to cool down before I drain it off. So my weighing curds, they've separated nicely and I've lined a bowl with a clean tea towel. I'm going to pour this in. Gather up the ends and give it a bit of a squeeze. You want to remove as much liquid as possible. And then I'm going to use the wooden spoon to wrap the ends around and you just want to let that drip for about an hour means the curd becomes nice and firm. So you can see we've just got the curd left and it's dried nicely. A tablespoon of sugar, a pinch of salt, ground almonds, and then some bitter almonds for the almond aroma. If you can't get hold of bitter almonds, you could use almond essence. You don't need to use too much. It shouldn't be overpowering. Now, to bring the mix together, I'm going to add an egg, single cream, and then you just mix it all together. All you need to do is spoon it into your ramekins now. Preheated oven at 175 degrees fan for roughly 15 to 20 minutes. You know when the oskaka is done because it's slightly golden on the top and it looks set. Traditional way to eat oskaka is with a good dollop of whipped cream and some cloudberry jam. Or you could have raspberry jam or whatever jam you fancy. It's hard to resist them when they're warm. Mmm, couldn't think of a sweeter way of finishing a meal. My trip through Sweden is over for now. I've met the most wonderful people and learned so much about the Swedish history and culture. My knowledge of Swedish food and what makes Scandinavian cuisine so special is vastly greater than when I started on my journey. I've come to appreciate the simplicity of the food and the clean and crisp flavors, a way of cooking I will keep with me for the rest of my life.